question and answers number eight. We're moving along. We've got lots of these coming out and uh, they're really working wonderfully. This is from Richard, this first question. I was wondering if instead of throwing away modern hand saws after its edge is dull, could you heat the edge with a blowtorch in order for the edge to loose its hardening, then, resh then sharpen it? Well, the question is whether it's worth it for one thing. Um, and it does depend on the nature of the steel that was used. If it was carbon steel, it could be air hardened steel, it could be oil hardened steel. There are different ways that manufacturers harden their steel. This is impulse hardened. Uh, this, this is where the, the teeth are impulse hardened. As you get with Japanese saws now, most Japanese saws will have impulse hardened steel which means they cannot be resharpened except by the manufacturer, which they don't do. And so what do we do with this? Can we, do we just throw them away? I think when he says throw them away, he probably means recycle them, right, Richard? So mostly the steel of uh, disposable saws does get recycled. Um, but so the question is, can you use a blowtorch to soften the steel? I don't know if it's air hardened. I would say no, because you have to apply the heat, but then the air hardens it again. So you have to use a different technique to soften the seal, but you could try it, and I think it would be worth trying. You could, though, as an alternative, just stick the saw in an oven, I think at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. These metallurgists out there will tell me differently. Um, and let the steel heat through for 45 minutes in the oven, and then try it with a file and see if it will file. It might just be hard enough then you may have annealed the teeth, which means you can, it's still hard, but you can sharpen it. So that's an alternative too. So different strokes for different folks. You could try it. I'd, I'm a great believer in experimenting, so just get out there and do it. Safety is your issue. You have to look at that. This one is from Jerry. He says, you seem to use sapili wood as a, gr a great deal. This could be sapili, sapelli. I've, I've heard it pronounced different ways. Um, aside from its obvious beauty, why do you use it? Well, you took away my glory there. I was going to say because it's very beautiful, but it is a, a lovely wood. Um, it's a very uh, stable wood um, and it's sustainable, but we did deplete it for many decades. It was depleted, depleted because it was such a lovely wood and it was very good. It came into uh, popularity because the genuine mahogany is the... Um, different uh, Spanish mahoganies and so on uh, from South America were depleted so badly that they needed, and then they became protected, which is wonderful. That's what we want, protected species. We want to be uh, good stewards of what we've got. Um, but in this case, um, uh, Sapili then came under attack, and now that's been um, protected in so many areas, and it's revitalizing itself, and it's coming back into glory again. But buying sustainably uh, or responsibly uh, harvested resources is the answer, in my view. Uh, it's certainly not a native species to Britain, that's for sure. Uh, it's a lot more dense than oak. Uh, it's a wonderful wood. I think we just like it, and it's a good substitute for the colour of mahogany. It's, uh, let me see, here's a piece. Um, sometimes I've seen it where I couldn't tell the difference. Sometimes it's called African mahogany, um, but its real name is Sapili, or its common name. I don't know what the Latin name is. But there you have it. It's got all these swirls, deep, rich grain. I think it's a lovely wood. It goes much deeper the, as it ages and oxidizes in the atmosphere. So that's for Sapili. This is from Lynn. Uh, I'm not sure about whether this is a, a male spelling, a female spelling, it doesn't matter. I'm making some 10 inch round breadboards and would love to know how you would put a bullnose profile on them. So let's do this with Lynn and see what we can do. Let's say we're going to make some round cutting boards. We've chiseled everything, we've got This shape coming together. We're going for an oval here, but it could be round, it could be any shape we want. Cheese board. 
there we've got our board coming together and you're asking how you can round this over. This is the most wonderful tool. It's a spoke shave, flat bottom. You don't need a round bottom very much. Take your spoke shave, get it set. Take the corner off at 45 degrees till it's about six to eight millimeters wide like this. I know you're already wanting to get out in the workshop and do this now. Get that nice and even like that and then bring the corner. I take that corner off, take this corner off. And now you have a quadrant and then you go in on the hard edges and just round it. This is wonderful for learning to work with the grain. Which way do I go? I'm going against the grain here. And it's still working because I've got a sharp, sharp spoke shave. But this feels like I, can you hear this? I'm stroking the cat backwards. We've got to go the other way for the bulk of this. So I'm going the other way now, taking out my damaged edge here. Take the corner off again. And you can go with ovals now. This is a nice thing. So that's one great way to work with that. Then the other way, can you see this? Nice shape here. Now you scrape this, sand it, whatever you want to do with it, get it super smooth. Here's another way that I think is a great way. You could use tools like these. These are called rasps. Um, they're, a lot, they're quite expensive. This one will cost you 15 pounds, $20, something like that. These might cost you a lot more. You can get inexpensive ones. So this one is basically taking the 45 degree corner off. It works very rapidly. So we do it the same way. This is coarser. And uh, I don't know the spoke shape works better, I think. So we've taken this down by abrading it, really. Then we go in here and take off the hard corner again. Work on this one. And then we work it around like this. And we still have flats on there. But that's another way of working this thing called wood. Like that. And you keep working it that way. And I don't think that's taken too long to do that. The spoke shave is much easier on your body and it works more quickly than the rasp. The rasp you could use after the spoke shave. You can use fine ones like this and refine it, but you can also use sandpaper after that and then you've got your round over done. So that's what I would recommend. Wonderful for working with children. Great for learning about the orientation of the grain when you're working with the wood. Dave. What tools are needed to resaw timber by hand? When you say timber, we might have different vernacular here because timber in the US would be a tree. So we're not gonna get into that because then we have to drop the tree, slab one face off it, flip it over, slab the other face off, we dig a hole in the ground. We're not going that route, are we? That's the old method. Other than that, you've got big resaw machines, but I don't think that's what you're talking about. I think you're talking about how do you resaw a block of wood, saw this down the middle. Um, it's very simple. If you want it, it wouldn't matter if this was a, a, a eight inch wide piece, 10 inch wide piece and three inch thick, you would use the same method. Set the distance. You plane up your first face like this one's already smooth. Plane up that first face. Set your distance here, set your distance here, and then work along these outside faces. And then you take your saw, depending on which type of saw you want to use. So these are the tools, you've got your plane is the first one. Saw down this face, square across that end, like that. Down here, turn it around. Saw down this one. Uh, 
and then saw it all the way down the, the wood, flip it one way, saw it again, flip it the other way, saw it again. Uh, we do have some videos on this type of work. It may not be for resawing, but that's what I would do if I was using hand methods. You can't, you, you can't get very far. The most efficient way is going to be by using a bandsaw. Probably that would be a great recommendation, but if you just don't have the facilities to do that, then that's what I would use, just a hand saw, a bow saw, frame saw, something like that, and you'll get there eventually. So that's how I would do it. Those are the tools you need, a plane and a hand saw. Uh, there's one thing about saws, when you are um, rip cutting, um, you don't want your saw to be, if you, if you are resawing, you need to use a rip saw, not a cross cut saw. So that means the teeth are square across, uh, rather than pinnacle teeth. And then um, also pick the right size, um, tooth size. I think when I'm resawing, I tend to go with a fairly large tooth size. So six points, up to eight points, or down to eight points. Ten points, it gets a little bit too fine for this type of work. Four points work on heavy material and especially on pines particularly well. Okay, so Ronald. Do you recommend high glue for a, long open, a longer open time? Open time is the amount of time the glue will allow movement while you're assembling a frame. Some glues go off very quickly, five minutes, five minute epoxy, things like that. So it cures very fast and you have to get your joint together and get everything in place. Sometimes we have big glue ups like a big chair or something like that. Usually we uh, glue up in what we call sub-assemblies. So we work out how we can glue up frames together first and then we gradually unite all the different frames together in larger assemblies. Open time and uh, uh, animal hide glue is a great glue because you do get that extended open time. You can move your components about for 15 or 20 minutes often during assembly and the, the glue gla gradually um, coagulates and dries and eventually it sets like glass, glass hard, it's very brittle. So I think I would use that for traditional repairs on antiques and I would certainly use it for instrument repairs on instruments that depend on uh, being able to take the glue apart after it's together like a violin or a cello. Um, I generally use PVA because it is proven, it does last a long time, you can re-glue when a joint comes apart, things like that. If I was looking for a glue for more open time, I might look more at a chemical glue-like epoxy of some type, which is a, a, usually a structural epoxy that has great strength and will glue the different components together and give me some of these glues might take 24 hours to cure. So I might have an open time of an hour or even two hours with some of them to work with. Um, animal hide glue, I probably wouldn't because it's not always that easy. You can get animal hide glues now that have a long open time and you don't have to cook them and stew them to make them work. So, but generally I don't use animal hide glue very much. Matt says, while setting the teeth on a 20 inch long, eight point per inch distance, the saw became quite wavy and bent. It was straight as an arrow before setting. I'm using a Dunlop pistol grip saw set. Is this com a common problem? It's not common at all, uh, Matt. Uh, it, I've never had a saw edge become wavy. Like I think we're talking here where it bent a bit like a hacksaw blade might. Uh, I've never had that happen, but I can see such a thing happening if the saw set is too much, if it's too deep and it's going onto the saw plate too far. It may be that this particular type of saw set uh, is, is going too far down onto the plate and that's causing this rippling effect. So. I would abandon it and get an eclipse, possibly, I don't know. I would look at the saw set and the method of using them. Thank you, that was great, another series done. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.